very hard to come uh, after a co the meeting and I want you to introduce me. Hello, I'm Mahalo. Um, people speaking and mahalo to everybody that came tonight. I really appreciate to see so much attentive faces in the crowd. There's a wonderful saying in martial arts is that thank your enemy. And so we should all thank one example for engaging and galvanizing people to talk about it. Frankly, um, without them, we would just still be going on. So we all need a good enemy. In Hawaiian, there is no word for enemy, it's part of the class, or it's a designated partner in struggle. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to kind of dovetail what was said and kind of wrap up, maybe, um, with this notion of what are alternatives to Monsanto. And some of the things that we've been trying to do in our work. And to really talk about, acknowledge that this is a conversation not about food, but about power. And power rests on narratives. Power rests in systems and structures that we, we live by, whether we're conscious or not. And that's a really important thing to aspire to. The, aspire, the aspiration is not to get Monsanto out, or to give them unto one of them. Aspiration is to become powerful ourselves. <clears throat> and around one of the most basic building blocks is food. No matter what your ancestry is, no matter where your Okuaho goes, somebody in your life, in your, in your genealogy, was a damn good farmer. I tell you that right now. And it still is, resides in our soul, in our seat of our soul. We carry our ancestor memory that's sometimes called consciousness, or other times called your conscience. So I just wanted to start with that one. <laughs> but I think the most, the most important thing for me is what is the narrative? of power that Monsanto presents. Let's look at that. <clears throat> um, one of the, the model that Monsanto uses, I'm not going to even critique it from a moral perspective, but my critique is about is economic forecasting. The truth that which, but the fallacy in their model is that they assume that oil will always be cheap. It may not even be a fallacy in their model, it's the fallacy in the model of people are in collusion with them who are in the state, who are charged with safeguarding the future of our children. Um, and that's kind of where the assumption starts for us. Is that, you know, <clears throat> this is a multinational corporation, and it three parts in, 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 in their supply chain, or so the way that they're structured, they're dependent on oil. We need to ship in the seeds, then the crops grow, we need to export, and then with the revenue that's generated from all the crops that you grow, because you're no longer growing your own food, you have to then import food. This model works if oil costs are kept at a certain level, which we know is not the case. As oil continues to become less abundant, and developing countries become more and more empowered to think that the Western standard of life is what they should expect. People like China, people like India, represent about 2 billion individuals this dwindling resource is going to be shrinking far more rapidly. And not only is that the problem, it's the way that these, these model movements, this agribusiness model is structured, it exactly, almost exactly replicates the plantation economy that held sway in Hawaii for almost 200 years. And being that that is the case, being that it's export driven, being that you, it's not locally owned, it's part of a multinational um, investment portfolio. Once the costs rise to a place where it's no longer tenable for them to be here, they're going to leave. 